All right, so this is the Meaningful Movement podcast, and I'm really excited to be here today with Toby Portella, who is in Berlin, Germany. And uh, I'm Seth Dellinger. I'm here in Washington, D.C. So just to introduce Toby, um, I asked him to send me some details of his movement practice, and there are many, um, and this might even be an incomplete list, but you're someone who's really, it sounds like practice movement your whole life, uh, from gymnastics as a kid, judo, badminton, aikido, uh, mixed martial arts, crossfit, um, if I'm saying this right, lameco esquina, is that right? Lameco esquina, yeah. Lameco esquina. It's Filipino, so it's uh, Spanish infused. Filipino martial art, okay. Yoga, and those are all things, um, you know, that you, you've done. And then today you are still involved with, and may, maybe you're still doing some of those things, but you uh, practice and teach animal flow, um, move net, functional range conditioning. Um, there's something out there that we might explain a little more, but it's called fighting monkey. And there's a special fighting monkey practice that you are quite accomplished at, which is the nine speed tool, which I'll ask you to show people maybe in a little bit, uh, just so they get an idea what it is. And you're a physiotherapist and um, you've done, you've just done many things. And uh, one other thing you mentioned that I thought maybe I would start with is a, maybe a, a way to see if it ties something together. I don't know. But you also spent, um, I think around a decade, you wrote uh, maintaining and repairing industrial machines. Yeah, eight years. Yeah. Yeah. So many, many different practices, but um, the nine speed tool, which we'll get to is a bit of a tool, but it seems that you have um, just a life where, where not only biomechanics, but um, the way things, other things aside from our human bodies fit together is something that you've been um, very interested in and explored quite a bit. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um thing about the working in, in the industry and repairing industrial machines, because as I also wrote to you, I was in Jesuit school. So uh, my education was mostly humanist. And my main um, topics in school were languages, English and French, and then history, political science, art, and when I left school, I probably thought I want to become a movie director and pretty quickly realized that is not a good way to go. Like it's a very unrealistic path to take at that young age, especially in Germany, the film schools, they won't take you that early. Plus uh, you need some money in the background to just apply for those schools, turn in your uh, application and then the other thing, political sciences wasn't a good option either because I quickly saw also from people I knew that once you finish those studies, which is like a bubble, like studying at the university political science is like a bubble. And this is the world, this is utopia you're talking about. And then now you have to work in that field because you're not, at some point you have to leave university and then you have to work either for a party or, um, or a journalist or as um, some kind of advisor. So all of these things, I saw that I would want to get involved with that. So I was thinking about beyond the education that I need to follow or that I wanted to follow. Most people at that age think, what do I want to do? And I was thinking, how do I work after that? And then what I saw was missing because I come from a somewhat intellectual educated household was the practical side of life. So I wanted to learn from scratch how to um, understand technology that governs our life. And that was like in Germany. So there is this dual system of where you have this training, um, which you could call trade school, I think, where you have practical training a lot. And then you have some theoretical um, schooling on the side. So it's a dual system, they call it. And the opportunity was to go and learn both mechanic and electronic, 
which is joined together as Mechatronic, a new thing they created in 2004. And I saw in, like this job offered me the opportunity to look I, into industry, which at that point, also like from my political analysis was what governs our society and B, just understand all kinds of machines that are important in our life. Understand electrical grids, how electricity is produced, um, what parts are involved in machines like these. So I wanted to understand all of that societal background that I hadn't seen before. And that's what I got. Mm -hmm. Plus it's interesting. Um, those are complex systems. They're not as complex as humans and societies of humans. But there, um, maybe that is actually even a good way to train dealing with comp more complex systems. So whenever you approach the problem like repairing a complex machine, you'd have to start by interviewing the person who was handling the machine and ask, what is your problem? What does it know? And because I, I was thrown into the pond, like I, after three years of training, they, um, I was hired straight away to do the job that my predecessor had been doing, the guy who trained me, because they fired him. They, they got rid of him. And they got rid of him in part because they were calculating that I would do his job. But like, it's a big leap. And then they started expanding the job, saying, like, now you're going to work in this other hall, too. This is now part of your responsibility. And then you'd go there and there's this complex machine that has been there for 10 years that has undergone some changes. Nobody has actually a good plan, a good layout of it. Fix it. And it's urgent. <laughs> and that was a good way to hack my way into like interviewing people on what does it normally do? What do you expect it to do? What is it not doing? And start from there, which is not the normal way of doing this or the traditional way of repairing my colleagues my older colleagues they didn't work that way and mm -hmm. when that got a boring and b not that good for my health and i could see that in the longer run a I, like i i didn't i was losing interest in it and i was aiming in a direction where I was leading a department and I was spending time at the desk and in conferences with um, the people leading these departments and the factory. So people I was not sympathetic and ideologically in line with. Well, I looked for something other to do. And that's how I then changed venue. And in the beginning, I still said, I am now going to repair humans where I, before I was repairing machines and over the three years of training as a physiotherapist and also practicing Feldenkrais in ATMs and then encountering the fighting monkey practice, I no longer say that. Mm -hmm. So I no longer repair humans. <laughs> you, you do or you don't repair humans? I don't. You don't? I, I don't. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's um, it's a familiar idea that I run across because um, you know people who have a different issues with their movement or 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 some kind of difficulty in movement will often come to a movement teacher uh, in a way that reminds us of the same way we bring our car to the mechanic. You know, this is wrong. Can you replace it? Um, but I love your story about looking at a machine. Um, probably not the way. A mechanic looks at a car where there is usually a pretty clear protocol once they identify what's going on but you had these mysterious machines that you didn't quite understand and so there was still a bit of a mystery to it um it also sounds like though so i i went through this whole list of uh different movement practices that you had been involved in since a young age but it appears that it did not occur to you for quite a long time that that would be your way of making your way through the world. It was something you did for yourself. You, you were very involved with movement, obviously, for a long time. Um, so you're saying it's only only around, um, what was it, 2017 or so that, that you began to turn towards teaching and, and helping others with their movement? No, well, I, I had taught self-defense very early on, like from my 20, 
to 20, 20 on. I did that for four years about then um, conditions changed. I didn't do that anymore. So I did teach movement before, but I taught it as I used it, which was serving a purpose. So I had this very mechanistic way of dealing with movement practice, which I wouldn't have called movement practice back then. I would have called it training. And it was combat training and combat conditioning. And um, what changed that was a bad disc herniation I had in my lumbar spine at the age of 25. So I also realized, okay, working physically in the factory, I can deal with that. Can't deal with the desk job. I know the desk job plus the work safety shoes that is going, that is like, that is crap for me. And so part of uh, changing my job description was I wanted to work in barefoot shoes. And uh, because I was only wore, I only wore barefoot shoes outside of the factory back then. And, and I was like, there must be a better job. Like there is no barefoot safety shoes. No, but um, before I didn't regard jobs in the like in the therapy or in the movement part world i didn't i did just didn't know how, how i would live that way mm -hmm. and i still don't necessarily know okay it's still a mystery to me and um what what i had when working in the industry was like a really good job security sure not in the beginning they tried to fuck me over with the contracts but we have some sort of fundamental union structure here in Germany due to our history. It's being eroded, but when you work at one of the biggest tech in companies uh, in Germany, you still have that job security. So you have a fixed income that's organized um, by this uh, salary structure. And then I was, I was basically not, not fireable. Mm -hmm. And I was moving upwards, like I was earning a lot of money. I was like, I no, I remember I was helping a friend of mine move, and I was sitting in this car with these two women who were studied sociologists working as social workers, and they were talking about jobs. And so they had studied sociology, and they were already working for a few years, and they were doing two jobs and earning less than me. Mm -hmm. I was like, I was having an easy life in the sense that I had one job. I didn't have like absolutely fixed hours. I had to work some overtime, but I was earning really good money for that. Like way more than people who study sociology. And yeah, well, there's this discrepancy in our society and yours as well, probably that people who do important jobs, they don't earn comparatively well enough. Mm -hmm. So for example, physios, nurses, all these uh, eight jobs in the, so, in the uh, health sector, they don't earn a lot, but for society, they perform a very important job, which is like, was demonstrated heavily over the last year. Still nothing has changed. <laughs> it's the, that's like the biggest irony of it all is they have talked about it. Like for example, I was working in one of the biggest and best known hospitals of Germany last year. And so they said, everybody's gonna get bonuses, Corona bonuses, because you have to work. And it's like half of the people, they didn't get it because I'm from LD. Oh yeah, that job, we forgot about that job group. And then in other hospitals that are not state owned, they didn't get any, it's like complicated till so they get it. and. In the end, they also reduced the amount they were going to pay and they didn't change anything about the working hours, which is one of the number one reasons people drop out of the jobs in the ICUs and all that. So, yeah. Well, no, so, I, yeah, there's a lot of changes involved. I mean, of course, when you're teaching movement, um, there, there are, and, and it's probably different in Germany than the U.S., but um, as I understand it, you're in business for yourself at this point, um, and most movement teachers here and I think most parts of the world, you, you you know, you're lucky to get hired as a movement teacher with a regular paycheck. 
I was also interested in, you know, some of the industrial situations you worked in because for myself, um, I could say that I also came from a family with more of an intellectual background, um, you know, and yet I ended up for a story I probably won't tell the whole thing now, but I, I worked in factories for about a decade in the food industry. So I was a meat cutter. And um, this was before I discovered uh, a number of things which led me to teach the Feldenkrais method. But what I didn't realize when I was in those factories and I was just dealing with the product and moving it around and you know working with these machines and then working on deadline and all of the noise and everything that was going on in there is that I was, I was moving and I was working with my hands, which was very different than everything in the background. And um, I had some nights because I often worked a night shift where just the demand of the work, which was repetitive, but often not repetitive in so much as like every movement I made was the same. It was like, pick up this cut of meat and put it on the bandsaw and cut it and then pick up the next one. But the, each cut is a little different weight. And it, you know, I, I, I got into these amazing um, kind of flow states sometime. And it was only looking back later when I sort of thought of myself as someone who studies movement that I realized, well, actually that experience was really uh, valuable to me. And um, before we started uh, our podcast, you were telling me what you were doing today. You were out exploring some old ruins. And um, I saw on your Instagram page, you were even I don't know if this was from today or from an earlier one, but you were climbing on a ladder somewhere, but it was this old kind of decrepit place and you, you wrote something that couldn't even be sure if the ladder was actually gonna hold me. You were not yeah, totally, yeah, yeah. Be aware. So um, yeah, there, there's many, many places to, to go in this conversation. And I, I do wanna get to some of what you teach, but maybe um, what I could ask you now, because it seems to relate to some of these things, um, the many things you do right now for for how you bring them together, you call it askeo kineo, and I, I might have pronounced it wrong, so you can correct me. I don't know. I don't speak Greek. Oh, okay, it's Greek. Okay, but but what does that mean? And 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 is could we say this draws because I saw something about how someone forms something or they form themselves, but it seemed like almost or it could be. There's something you wrote that how this relates to us as humans, but maybe it also relates. So Askeo Kaneo, does, does, that, does that connect some of these dots? So, no, that's just, I need to find a name. <laughs> and, <laughs> but I, I like the complexity of all the languages. So mm -hmm. I had to study Latin in school and I didn't study Greek. This is ancient Greek now. So when I looked it up, how did I get to ancient Greek? I don't remember. So what I did, but what you see is kinesis is the word for movement and askesis is the word for practice. But those words in our languages, both English and German, they are in like, the German word for that is pretty flat. So when most people in German, when they say they do yoga, they say, I have, I go to my yoga practice. Well, my yoga practice, which they derived from English. The German word praxis doesn't really, well, in my opinion, isn't really apt to that. So I was looking to more complex, in a, to a more complex word. And the ancient Greek did give that to me. And then I took it and to put it into a first person word, verb. So a scale is I, um, I practice and it has this complexity of, um, or the practice is not limited to what we know as training. And this re like reverberates more with the way that you and I regard movement practice and still there where it's like some movement practice, my movement practice, uh, it doesn't do it justice. So uh, Askeo is from Askesis and Kineo is actually interesting. It's the, this is the part where you said to, um, to move and to, but then it's also, it's not like I move my body and I can move from somewhere to somewhere else. 
So it's also a locomotive uh, verb. And oh, and you said uh, you wanted to know the one to form at the door, right? So right. That's, that was the tool. that's Askesis tool. Um, so I put those on my uh, on my uh, website with the definitions, and I don't even want to. That's what I like about it that it has these complex defin or these multifaceted definitions. That's why I don't even want to lay it like down and hammer it down and say like that's how I mean it. That's how it's supposed to be. It reflects a complexity. Okay, so. That's funny. I, I was sure that we were going to tie it all together with just that phrase. But yeah. part of what I wanted to hear a little more about, because you talked about your earlier teaching of self-defense and training, and then you said, but I don't think of it as training anymore. Um, you also brought up the idea of repairing machines or repairing humans, and that you, you're not repairing people who come to see you. But obviously, you're doing something. So what's the difference in your conception of movement today and the way you teach it or the way that you personally explore movement compared to what you were doing at the time that you were training or you were training other people? OK, so when I, when I do, was doing self-defense and when I was practicing the martial arts in the beginning and then even CrossFit, it was all about performing better. So in this case, aggression outwards. So amp up the performance in general, like the output, and uh, either force, speed, and endurance, and the output of aggression towards external like, entities, other people. So how can I damage other people better? And in the self-defense scenario, so this came up because it was more of an applied martial arts. I tried to I, I tried to compete once in MMA and I hurt myself right before the fight so, and I had to drop out. And then afterwards, job-wise, I gave up on it doing night shifts. Uh, like that doesn't give you a good environment for training for preparing for a fight. But so my aim was always more in a setting that yeah, you'd call it anti-fascist. And so the, now, nowadays it's like, I won't touch the word anti-fa anti because it has taken a weird turn and many people now understand something by it. And also I wouldn't like, back then, yes, we did use that and it came from Germany, the way that it's being used now internationally, let's not touch that. So, but it has to do with being able to defend yourself against political violence. And in other words, in your in your your growing up, it, it didn't feel like a oh, it would be cool to know martial arts. It was like a real thing of I might need to defend myself. I, yes, in that situation, so. like at that point in my life, yes, mm -hmm. and it was definitely a necessity and a very like that became a, the driving goal of it all before when you look earlier like the judo that i did as a youth that was actually my parents following an advice from uh i think shy, a child psychologist or something because i had beaten somebody up in school and I know, and then somebody else beat wanted to beat me up and i took a knife to school i was like so this bigger boy he, he wanted to beat me up he, he was threatening me i took a knife like a Swiss army knife to school and showed him like I have a knife. Mm -hmm. So that got me into a lot of trouble because then this guy, he read it out to his parents and they went to the teachers and it would create a lot of confusion. So um, they, they said like, okay, this child, he has to deal with his aggressions, let him do judo mm -hmm. so that he doesn't feel the need to go to knives anymore, which is ridiculous. I, nowadays I have ended up with knives again, like for years now but it's still the best option for uh, in the in that regard but back then that was like put in there and then later i went to do aikido and it wasn't um zen aikido so it was all about meditating in the movement and now when i reflect back on it it's like wow i really found a gem there that guy that was teaching it got he, he hey there's something that would interest me today 
and I don't know what I realized what I was doing there like the knowledge that I had found there it was very simple and I liked it so I did it but then that all like dropped out when the focus became something totally different not inward but outward and the problem with going outward and focusing on outward in any way and that is what I would say today is you always you're playing against yourself or you're uh, borrowing against your own health because the if you want to if you just look at amping out the output and especially with aggression amping it out outwards it's always also going to turn inwards and in other words, you, you can do yourself some harm if you're you're trying to put too much force outwards yeah for example so i was grappling for mma and I was a small guy always. So back then I used to weigh like 70 kilos, a little bit less maybe, depending on like fluctuation. So usually if you were to train seriously for MMA, you wouldn't train with very heavy guys. But I was training with people of 90 kilos and 80 kilos, just because we had like that, those were the training partners in the group. And I was consciously doing that because I said like, well, my aim is not doing this in the cage or in the ring i want to be able to do this in the street and out there people are heavier than me so i need to deal with that but looking back on it after my injury my spinal injury i was like well that was probably not a very sane thing to do trying to grapple against very heavy guys so tr when they drop down on you and they pin you to the ground trying to get out beneath them and it's just not it's not good for your body if you're forcing it. So I wasn't doing it like very artistically. And um, I was I was basically fighting. I was trying to fight on the mat. So also not the best intention for a BJJ, by the way. But it was MMA. And um, getting out from heavier guys trying to buckle uh, out of them. It's just it's a lot of compression on your spine. And also the way of cro the crossfit was is designed and i i do crossfit there's a lot of injustice probably because i always go on about crossfit the way they came it came from the military so it came from navy seals and it was like a selection process where you try to grind people down and see who can resist it mentally and so those who drop out mentally they're gone it's a selection process and then also those who can't uh, regenerate physically well enough they drop out naturally they get injured so the military ends up with an elite force of people who are mentally very very hardened and physically have a good um i'd say disposition to regenerate well and resist those forces well so these are their elite soldiers make sense if you're a grind uh, if you have a meat grinder and some people would come out uh, unharmed and the rest is well, ground meat um so yeah that, that attitude is a militaristic one and militaristic in the way when you're and it's not even the best way to become a soldier as you see in the old like in the ancient eastern forms they have the same conflict so you have the pure art in the Eastern forms that says like, you have to balance uh, all of your martial stuff with energy work and all that. And then you had uh, generals in the later times in China who had said, yeah, but we need to prepare our armies and we need to cut some of that crap. And um, they look at the big outcome. So the big outcome in a, on an army sends away and the military sends away is not the individual. So, and when you're dealing with yourself, you shouldn't think that way. That is a lesson that I learned. So you can't be your own general and like take that loss. So you need to look out for yourself as an individual. And that means do not harm yourself. Like that is the most important part of my practice now, which doesn't mean do not take any risk of being harmed. As you can see, I climbed ruins. I climbed chimneys that are like 50 meters high. I don't know whether it will sustain it. 
I'm guessing and testing is some kind of adrenaline rush, certainly also part of it, but it's also do not train or do not think that you're training towards a positive outcome with a negative training. Mm -hmm. Now you, you mentioned a sort of a change in perspective at some point, and I don't know if it's because I'm a Feldenkrais practitioner, you mentioned the word Feldenkrais and that popped out. Um, I wasn't sure if that was part of where you changed perspective, but um, so, so I wanna ask you about that. But you know, if someone goes to Instagram and looks at the page and sees some of the things you do, you certainly, you know how to lift your own body weight and move it. You, you're doing things that are powerful. You're using strength, um, but you've, you've left behind that meat grinder idea. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm, again, I'm just curious. So, and, and, and maybe having been through that, you have a perspective, you know, that, you know, others wouldn't have, and, and you know, kind of what you've left behind. There's a lot of what you're doing today that people, you know, a lot of people just, they, they never exert themselves to the degree that you do. I, you certainly do use exertion, but it seems like you're talking about a much more uh, intelligent approach, a lot more, um, a lot more respect for your own structure and your own, your own biology as you go on to practice tomorrow, not just today. So yeah, pricks, like pricks all my life. It's exactly. the thing of um, aging well. So obviously when you get past a certain point in your life, you know that you're aging before you didn't realize it or you thought that's going to start later. And um, so my injury at 25 was like a big cut because I couldn't move for six weeks pain, without pain. And uh, I had a friend, an osteopath who helped me very early on get back into movement and use movement to get out of that state very successfully contrary to what my like the um, orthodox mds were would have told me and then told me afterwards like when i came back after six weeks with an mri uh, result they're like yes you have a disc herniation well you seem to be moving pretty well and like, yeah yeah i'm doing yoga so i don't need your help I, i'm not coming back here and so that was an experience. Movement can help me get out of pain, can, get, can heal me. And then the next uh, experience to make was definitely Feldenkrais, encountering the Feldenkrais method through ATMs that I've been following for, I think, three and a half years now, pretty continuously. And um, that was all, always a very good balance to my physio training because in physio training, they teach you this is look at this person standing this is the bad posture you need to correct it to this posture and all that so in fed class very early on you understand okay it's not about the external cues when you feel in, into yourself you realize that it's not the external cues that validate something and it's not posture it's moving out of a posture if you need to use the word out of a position and the potential to move or the quality of the movement out of it and so these two elements already the third element is really also an understanding that i did i gained through fighting monkey practice and there is a like so one of the main teachers uh, joseph fruchek he says like the strength component is the last that we put in there that we try to reach. So when you see me doing stuff that we would term power exploration, where I'm playing with tools, with weighted tools, and I'm moving them very dynamically, especially that's what I what got me interested in them also with the nine speed tool is the power is being reflected back on you. You have a feedback mechanism to perceive what power you're generating and how it can turn back on you on your joints so this is something that when you look when i look back at how in crossfit i was taking like a medicine ball and throwing it up the wall and catching it and dropping it into a squat and then throwing it back up and catching it dropping into a squat um, you're creating a lot of 
internal forces there, compressions and shearing forces. So that is something that a physio knows too. But you can still do that. Like I now play with heavy wooden spheres. Um, I practice with them and I also throw them and catch them, but I throw them and catch them with a totally different focus in mind. So what comes before now is perceptiveness to these forces, to the position I'm in, to how the force is dissipated from my body. I'm not throwing the thing up there because I have to throw it up there 50 times in one minute or um, because I have to throw it in a certain height or whatever, drop down a certain depth in my squat. But I'm throwing something up there to catch it because I want to, to feel and analyze Yes, analyze the way that the force is going to be generated and dissipated from my structure. So it is a more of a feedback game that I'm looking into, as is the nine speed tool. I'm not trying to perform a form, uh, but I'm trying to learn how my body will generate and manage forces. And it is a lot more about the coordination. So the coordination is the most important part of learning any movement. And actually no one could really disagree that coordination is the base, the base for learning movement. It's very obvious, but it's not a, like a skill level that is challenged a lot. Mm -hmm. So it's mostly just cut out by saying, here's good form. If you can perform good form, you're done, you're good. So this optimal, optimal state or form, um, the sheer impossibility of something like that existing for everybody, like all the different individuals with the different compositions and even for one individual in time. So in us changing from day to day, our bodies feeling different from day to day, depending on what we did yesterday, what we ate, or if we were sick. So there is no such thing as a perfect state, a perfect form, perfect um, po um, pose, posture. So once you realize that, how do you train from there? And that is one of the answers I found through the fighting monkey practice and a lot of questions I found. So uh, it has really rounded off something that started with an injury and went on. And I think the most important factor before fighting, fighting monkey practice was Feldenkrais because it has the deepest anal analytical layer. And it taught me a lot about perceptiveness and still does. So I still make discoveries in ATMs as like, Oh, wow. <laughs> I didn't, I, I should have known that. Yeah. Uh, but it's different from knowing and realizing it in the feeling, experiencing it, experiencing is a good word. Mm -hmm. yeah. You and I talked, uh, I think a couple of years ago, and we were talking about Feldenkrais and also another thing that you've been involved with functional range yeah. conditioning. And I don't remember if we talked about fighting monkey. Um, I think you've got quite a lot of experience with fighting monkey, but I, um, I, I went to one workshop a number of years ago and that, that's, I wish I'd done more, but it, it, it had a real impact on me. Um, as we go on, um, I'll, I'll say a couple things about that. Um, and maybe you can say more, there might be people watching who, who really just don't know what is, we're talking about. We say fighting monkey, but, um, this connection between, um, you know, you were, you're doing the thing in the CrossFit gym and you're throwing the ball and catching it and doing it and there's a kind of a repetition to it. And of course, when you throw it, it might bounce off the wall a little differently. I have to come a little over here, over there. But um, for me, the Fighting Monkey workshop that I attended was all about the fact that kind of like you were saying, there's, there's no consistent form. So, you know, one of the first things they did with us was a kind of a squatting practice and, you know, everyone just sort of begins to do what they know of as squatting. And it's like, well, that's how you squat in a gym, but can you squat with one foot in front of the other? Or can you go, you know, can you turn your head this way? And you find out very quickly, actually, there's an infinite number of different configurations that are squatting. And of course, if you have to 
you know, squat to get something under the sink, you know, you're probably going to do one of those strange variations and not some form from the gym. Um, and I had been, I think, maybe three or so years into my Feldenkrais training when I went to this workshop. And of course, the other difference, um, I mean, it's a world of difference. Feldenkrais is usually on the floor. It's generally very slow and it's often very internal. Whereas Fighting Monkey, you're often paired with a partner um, and you're doing some sort of a sparring kind of game or um, you're challenging each other's balance, but there's a lot of interactive stuff. And I had this experience in the workshop and I remember I was, I think someone was, you know, sort of pushing me here and pushing me there and I was trying to, but I had this moment of saying, you know, this is, this is nothing like Feldenkrais method, but it's actually the thinking is very much like Feldenkrais because I'm being asked to do things that I don't know how to do. Now, of course, in Fighting Monkey, it's, it's happening like this, whereas in the Feldenkrais method, it's like, can you turn your head to the left and take your eyes to the right? Oh, you didn't quite get it, that's all right. Let's slow it down, let's try it again. And like you sort of study this one movement and after a while you realize, wow, I can move my eyes in a different direction in my head and something changes. Um, but I, I wanted to, so, so you, can, you can help me if there's more to say about Fighting Monkey. I mean, Linda and Joseph have created so many different games, um, but you, I asked you before if you would grab the nine speed tool and I think you have it with me. And this is one of their more recent innovations that I haven't, um, I haven't had a chance to try, but that is the nine speed tool. And I, I don't know why the number nine, can, can, you, can you say what it is? And, and, uh, I could, I but I won't. I'm not sure <laughs> how much of the secret I'm allowed to oh, uh, okay. don't give you here. <laughs> no, um, number nine in um, Chinese, practice has some sort of meaning. So um, Joseph comes from Tai Chi, has taught Tai Chi for a long time. So he must have a reason for the nine. It's not important to me in the first line to tell you why it could be number nine, but speed is a factor of it because in it is a weight. So. Mm -hmm. In the park, I was recently asked, like, what's this dumbbell called you're using? Where can I get it? I'm like, okay. So people associate weight with it. They see how I use it. So they can, mostly they read how I use it. Okay. And then they they can see that there is some weight to it. And because of the momentum. And then the basic or the one of the biggest factors changing how you use this to how you use dumbbells is the speed. We move this one pretty quickly. So I'm going to do this. Well, I won't move my camera now. So what I can do here is we can do punches, okay? Or of different sorts, we can do throwing. I'll try to do it slower. The camera doesn't pick it up that well, okay? And all kind of, um, manipulation, okay? But then also tricks like these where you move it around your hand. So you change the axis, but uh, you want to feel it. Okay, so it's a feedback tool. So it's faster than you usually use weight. So it's a speed tool. It gives you speed to a certain extent in manipulating weights. It doesn't necessarily make you faster with uh, in any regard because it's also slow. Uh, uh, sorry, conundrum here. Um, it's really interesting because when I started training with it, practicing with it, it was like, this should have been here like 10 years ago when this could have like taught me so much about my punches when I was doing MMA. It's like, wow. And with time, it's become much more than that to me, obviously. And I use it with all kinds of people. It's not about the punching. That was the first thing that caught my eye. And this way of giving you a perception for the weight of your arm, for example. So many people, and you went to a workshop. So I want to say that you went to a workshop. The workshop with Fighting Monkey 
is one part of the practice. So over the last year, no workshops allowed. So the, the practice now has shifted right now a lot into the private realm of uh, solo practice. Mm -hmm. So now we're having online classes. That's not that solo, but it's still one person in the room you, you, normally. So they adapt to that, to the situation. There is other aspects of the practice that are not what you experienced in the workshop. But obviously in the workshop, it's many people. Let's do something with people. Because that's something that most of the people who came to the workshop, they can't do it on their own. So right. it's a very intense experience. And it is somewhat similar to Feldenkrais, but it's very different. Of course, yeah. So in Feldenkrais, ATMs, you're trying to minimize the perception, the stimulus, to feel it better. There's one of his like um, first- if you have, Yeah, if you minimize the effort you can be more sensitive yes. to tiny so, details. So that's often the practice is to let's let's first reduce the stimulus so that yeah. we so fighting monkey practice, it's a lot of stimulus. Right. And confusion, create confusion and let the system deal with it. Because there is and then what fighting monkey practice gave me a lot was a better understanding of playfulness, which like I had in mind, I read Todd Hargrove and the Guide to Better Movement. And it's like, he, now he has a book out that's called something with playfulness. I don't mm -hmm. remember the title. But it's like, those concepts were not that new to me, but really understanding what it meant, which could mean in practice, that's what I understood through them, through those games, through this, uh, seeing these games as a universe that you can discover. So every game is its own universe. And I find that somewhat different from Feldenkrais practice because, or also that my perception of that has changed over the time, but ATMs, each ATM is a universe, but basically you are the universe. So you don't have interaction with other people in ATMs normally. Mm -hmm. I, my teacher has done some stuff with us, but that was more from the dance side and because she's also a dancer choreographer so that was from dance improvisation and that one like links very well to what i do with fighting monkey practice mm -hmm. but normally in film christ practice in atms you don't have interaction with another person and then again in uh function integration you do stuff that you also do in a uh, fighting monkey workshop which is for example move somebody else and but they have a more active role so what we do a lot is we do partnering games where you're exploring somebody else's body, but not totally relaxed, but you're exploring it by giving an input and seeing how it will, how they will perceive the input, how they react. There's a game like where you take the pinky and the thumb and you'll move them in space. And the other person has to, is like following you. So you're leading in a way, but it, it gets into this loop where I'm leading you and then I'm feeling how you are following and that will influence how I'm leading you. So it all comes down to what you say is like a communication and process through touch and movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is a very, very important um, part. I think that Feldenkrais practice has not really touched on from what I have read and what I, from what I have seen. And it remains yeah, I, like a world that is not explored. I, I absolutely agree. Um, and, and, and I mean, I could point to examples. I could tell you things that, you know, happened to me in a Feldenkrais training, you know, where we did things, but we're also training to be practitioners. I was going to say, in the Feldenkrais training, where it's like... Right, exactly. But this is not what everyone is doing. Um, there is a Feldenkrais lesson where you may have done this where the essential movement is just the opening and closing the hand. It's called the bell hand. And you do it very slowly. And there's a way that if you continue, you can begin to feel this kind of pulsing movement that really passes through the whole body. It's a kind of this opening and closing. It goes everywhere and it changes the quality in your hand and it, it can really create a global change. And I, I did a workshop a number of years ago where I just had people hold not, not hold hands like the way that, you know, you hold hands a little kid, but 
they put their hands in each other's hands like this at the beginning. And then we did a practice like this. And then we did it again at the end. And I just simply asked them, how much information are you getting from your partner's hand? And of course, again, at the end, and um, there was quite a change, but it, it, so it was, it was this practice of sensing into another person, trying to feel some information. And the workshop wasn't about training Feldenkrais practitioners, but it was something more to do with interpersonal relationships and the fact that we can go into a place where we don't know anyone and we feel uncomfortable and that can be reflected in the body and that kind of thing, but how we can also learn to tune in, um, well, also to tune not only into ourselves, but tune into others or tune into what's going on around us. Um, and I've also had a number of experiences, obviously not over the last year with contact improvisation, um, which I don't know if you've tried, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's halfway between wrestling and dancing, you might say, but you're, you're sharing weight all the time. And there's a kind of explicit permission that someone may lean their weight on you, but you can lean your weight on them. And um, I always found when I was doing that practice, that when I would go and dance and share weight with people and, you know, maybe we would lose our balance and we'd go down, but we would find the way to go down together without anyone banging you know, their head or banging their elbow or something. I always thought, wow, I'm, I'm learning so much that I'm gonna go back and apply in Feldenkrais. And so um, I agree with you, there's this enormous potential for a sort of improvisational uh, situation where you're still, uh, really working to sense deeply what you're doing. And it's funny because while the fighting monkey practice is so intense, uh, it, I'd say one of the things that it shares in common with Feldenkrais is it creates these problems for you to solve. Even in your solo practice with the speed tool just now, when you began the movement and you were holding it here, the weight was behind your hand and then you extended it and the weight had come out over to the other side. And of course it was changing as you were moving it through space, but it occurs to me, um, that's a harder problem than lifting a weight in the gym. I mean, you would have to do that intelligently and to have some sense of how does this weight not, how does it travel all the way into the middle of my body? So anyway, there's a number of things here, but um, I just kind of got excited because what you said, I've felt for a long time that this potential of what we do when we practice uh, by ourselves um, in the Feldenkrais method, there's definitely a lot of potential to connect there. And you know, people people take Feldenkrais and then they go into tango, or they take it and they, they practice martial art and they make the connections. Um, but there's something about that way of internal listening that if you could create a practice with others to do that would be. Yeah, a, a, an enormous potential. And I think that can, like, those two things can coexist very well because the, there's a big benefit about the Feldenkrais take, uh, method. Method, yes. Um, we don't call that in German. Well, oh, you, we do, we do. I don't call it that way. Okay, but the, so there is experience. Mm -hmm. There is um, like many, there, several, um, generations of practitioners who have made experiences with it and shared those, communicated about those. So there is already a bigger knowledge, a deeper knowledge in time about it. And I think it can stand as it is and it, it need not encompass all of it. And it has given me in the way that it is maybe limited. It has given me this ability, this, um, ability to tune into listening internally, which I have then used with very well in the zero forms practice, which would be like the um, movements that are a bit like Tai Chi in the fighting ranking that also originated more from Tai Chi, where you will repetitively uh, perform one focus on one joint, okay? And then you'll see what else is happening, where it's going. And 
the ability to tune into that already and not isolate like I learned earlier from other systems um, definitely came from Feldenkrais. That is how we met because I was like, I was getting into Feldenkrais and I was already a FRC practitioner and using it. And I was realizing that the way I was using it on myself maybe created some of the blockages, some of the rigidities that I was encountering in Feldenkrais ATMs. So I was originally, I wanted to ask you because I saw that you had some connection. I think it was a person. Yeah, I did a workshop with someone where we presented some Feldenkrais and some FRC side by side, and that didn't end up continuing into a long-term thing. But um, yeah, I was exploring FRC, and I think I put some posts online that you must have seen. And yeah, yeah. So, some, somehow, I found you over that connection, and it was like, does this collide? Does this um, uh, maybe, let me put it out there, does the FRC harm my motor control, my motor system? Is it, what harm is it doing with, while doing some benefit? So to weigh these two against each other. And so I, I wanna get back to the other stuff that we were talking before, but that is an interesting point because nowadays it's not like I don't use FRC anymore. Mm -hmm. FR and FRC are the trainings, are the base of my therapeutic uh, engagement with patients. Uh, one of the big columns, which is dealing with tissue, specificity, palpating and treating in that way, and assigning exercises, stretches, force inputs, because it's very accessible to people. I can explain it very well. It's safe. It creates safety. And it's a good entry into dealing with pain and injury in the motor system of people who have not are not dancers or anything and but at the same time i very early on i now start assigning other exercises that will integrate the joint more because even even when i recognize there is a need or a benefit in isolating and putting very like focused force inputs into tissues that maybe need regenerating and uh, I also very early on tried to start them into using that joint in an integrated manner in an integrated fashion to not have them stiffen up, loosen them up. That's by the way, was the story I wanted to get out also how we met, but oh, yeah. mm -hmm. so how do we get back into this? Well, so here's a question that I, I probably asked everyone on this podcast uh, in one way or another, but you've you've done so many movement practices and along with that obviously you've probably experienced so many different movement teachers who i can only imagine had different styles and you were just talking now about um, working with patients where there's a particular protocol that you might give to them but then you sort of say well i need to give you something else that's a little different and i guess you know, in the world we live in right now, and especially over the last year where everyone's taken their movement practice to some degree online, if you look around, there's so many different things out there. We, we haven't even talked about animal flow, which you teach yet, but you teach many different things. You've practiced many different things. Um, and obviously, you know, you got value out of each of those things, but you also encountered um, some pieces, you know, that were less useful for you, or they were useful at a certain time, and then they, their usefulness came to an end for you. So it's kind of a general question, but um, how do you sort, how do you pick and choose among the many elements that come from different directions and that were maybe presented to you, um, you know, Sometimes there, there'll be people who teach in terms of this is correct and that is wrong. And then, you know, maybe a Feldenkrais or fighting monkey approach might be more like, well, if you explore this, what, what happens? What do you find out? What do you learn? Um, but at the end of the day, we, 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 none of us can juggle all of these things simultaneously. So how would you describe your process of kind of putting together, um, you know, your, your own movement um, for yourself or, or if you're with a client or a patient and a particular um, challenge that they face, 
what kind of things do you do knowing that you could draw from all of these different areas? How do you, how do you focus things? So do, these are two very different distinct settings. The one where I, where I would speak about how I do it and the one where I work with a patient. Well, Starting with the patient, with you, maybe. Let's, I can finish the patient very quickly because I do whatever the patient needs and whatever the patient can relate to. So that's what guides me. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's an open process. So it's also occurring over time. And something that unfortunately in Germany is not very common or not very appreciated is I give people exercises. In, but the most important thing to me is that these are exercises that they can want and will perform. So, right. uh, so the feedback loop is very important. So I gave you these exercises. Did you do them? Did they help you? Did they hurt? Did you understand them? Do you need any other information about them? And then, for example, if I've given them four different exercises, which is a lot for the general patient, and they come back and they say, well, this one I didn't do, the other one I didn't understand, these two I have been doing, and the one I really liked. So from that, I then draw my conclusions, what, how the other free exercises, how I might A, adapt them or B, replace them against something that is more akin to the one thing that worked. And that is a very comfortable position for the patient because they can rely on my authority and I need to take that away as soon as possible because I don't want to have them dependent on my authority because they're, it is not real. It is something that they sought out and that I, but I, I want them to understand that I'm there to help them, but I'm not there to tell them and I cannot tell them there's this, like false security that will lure them into a trap and that then reflects back on how i deal with um encountering different movement teachers um so the most important thing is can you ask questions so if you're practicing with somebody learning from someone and you can't ask questions or there's stuff that when you ask you won't get an answer to that is a big telltale to leave. And, um, or will all the questions be answered unambiguously? So if there is no ambiguity allowed in the system that is being taught, something's off too. So basically avoid gurus, avoid gurus, big thing. Um, so for example, for a time I was doing this yoga style that was a new thing bowspring yoga i think it's still pretty fringe i hope um so this guy and i won't drop names now but you can research that if you want so he comes in and he says like well in the way that we've been doing yoga for decades now is tucking the tailbone and like straightening the lower back and then but the spine is like shaped in the lower doses then so the neutral spine the better term for it is neutral spine is paramount and the neutral spine also allows for some amortify amortizing of compression compressive forces so, yes so we should always strive to perform any sort of pose or movement in neutral spine it is key try to not tilt your pelvis backwards never sorry Big new thing worked very well for me after my um, disc herniation because it put me in a protective state and taught me how to move better in this protective position of my lumbar spine. So it was a very good tool at that time. I was fascinated. I was like, I totally bought into that. But I, then also for doing Feldenkrais and I, I was realizing, well, even if the spine is shaped originally in that way and there's like a useful position for all kinds of things, it has the ability to move the other way too. So maybe it was wrong to always put it into the other position, into a straight lower back, uh, always keeping it in a lower doses. 
is not the answer to whatever question you might have had due to the other problem. So I was then also doing like animal flow. I was teaching animal flow and I was like realizing you can just do any movement like squatting on the ground. If you want to squat comfortably, like low squatting, not weight squatting, low squatting on the ground, you can't keep like this. It's ridiculous. It's like, no way. And um, also I was doing FRC. So FRC talks a lot about um, joint health. So if your lower back joints, if this joint, if the, your lumbar joints, they never flex, you're creating stagnation in those tissues. So all of this, I was learning from other sources. And, I went, and then I went and then on a big workshop, I because there was like, we're open for questions. And I was like, well, aren't you creating a new template to counter the old bad template that you say is bad, but isn't creating a template a problem in its own? right isn't that the actual problem creating a template and saying this is good this is the only good thing you ever have like don't leave this best position off yeah and so i got told off i was like no you haven't you haven't understood it yet you haven't practiced it well enough you need to keep going it was like <laughs> definitely not never coming back here and that was a great experience i wouldn't like wouldn't want to miss it but it's something I can tell people and hope that they will learn from it and that they will recognize when they encounter this early. Well, I think a lot of people would ask a question like that and get told off and maybe think, oh, I, I really, that was a really dumb question I just asked. Like, you know, not everyone would necessarily confront or decide that's the last time I'm coming, right? It's so I, I appreciate what you said earlier about working with a patient who may be, um, you know, the place to start is not some exploratory fighting monkey kind of situation. And you talk about using your authority because you have, uh, you know, you're the expert in this case and they came to you, um, but you're doing that to create safety. And yet at the same time, you want to relinquish the authority and give them a sense of autonomy as quickly as possible. But it sounds like, you know, you through your own experience, had to develop that. And then I, I would think that this is, again, a kind of an advanced stage, not so much in even necessarily the understanding of the joints that you were talking about, but the willingness to question uh, some kind of authority who's teaching you in your movement. And I think it's actually crucial. I mean, Feldenkrais, you know, a lot of his genius was that he, he just questioned things and he did things in a new way. And in fact, Feldenkrais practice, um, and again, we keep pairing them together, and I don't know if maybe we're overdoing it, but I think also in fighting monkey practice, the question is, is very important often, um, but it's true. It's, there are certain stages or certain situations where probably what we need is someone to help us uh, find the answer in a very direct way, and other points in time, it's actually helpful to say, okay, well, if I don't give you the answer, how might you find it yourself? Well, I have a very good bias because I've al always questioned authority. And that is something I would wish for more people to have in general. And so that's why I meant when people come to a physio practice looking for help from a physiotherapist for healing, um they're looking for authority when somebody is looking for authority and you can't just tell them off and say like well there is no such thing you can't give them this confusion of complexity and ambiguity because they're looking for a straw to hold on to so they they want certain they want safety um but it's i don't start that way with everybody some people, especially with neurological diseases, I wouldn't start that way. I wouldn't because I can and they have their own experience. So if you have neurological diseases, um, you can't simulate that. I can't, I don't know what it feels like for them. I can imagine in some ways that where I say like, okay, somebody with a stroke, um, doesn't have efferents from his arm, doesn't feel the arm, or can wants to move the arm, doesn't move. 
Okay, but most in all of the um, neurological diseases, you know, it's a total individual state. They have an experience that's very individual to them. It's a totally different universe than mine. And I can speak to that. So I tell them that it's their way, that I can't give them the answer, that I can just give them a, um, an environment to explore their state right now. And, and that this exploration will trigger um, neuroplasticity and that through exploring more what is maybe damaged or impaired that we will restore more but that is as far as I can go and so with all of the joint stuff you can like people also think because there's many authorities out there in Germany it's osteopaths that will say like hey, I can fix it I can fix it from the outside I can come I have very good hands and I have this knowledge is secret knowledge very complex and when I I can work your joint and I can work your bowels because they're interconnected and they'll do something to your cranium and then it's very all encompassing and then you'll be healed and obviously I don't adhere to that but with neurological diseases nobody can deny that that's not possible and or that's totally impossible. But yeah, I hope that through then opening this ambiguity up to people after giving them this initial security and telling them, well, you need to leave my practice sometime. Actually, you leave it every time. But it's like, there will be a point where you don't come here anymore. And I don't can't provide you any answers because now you can come next week and you say, now my pain has changed or I have encountered this problem now and or my range of motion has improved but now i have pain here or i can't do this and at a certain point i try to give him this information that the environment you're living in is very complex and as much as i can ask you about interview you about your the constellations in your life the conditions that you have been moving in you you will have to be independent and find out like find solutions beyond what I can give you. And I have the best results I've had with patients are those that understood that or the moments that they understood it. And then they came back and like, oh yeah. And then I realized, for example, um, I realized that when I stroke my cat that sits on the fridge, now I can lift my arm that high. So people with shoulder pain in this case. And that is what I strive to do in all my patients. But due to the expectations that they come in with, I don't achieve in all of all the cases. Yeah. And with a movement teacher too, okay? So yeah, we haven't talked about animal flow. Um, animal flow is a locomotive system where you move on the ground on all fours mostly all the time so uh, it um, models on animal movements so you have these different animals so you have the crab walk where you're walking uh, with your belly button up to the ceiling on all fours and then you have the beast walk where the belly button is pointing down and then you can lift your butt up and you have a um, bear walk and and i've seen you move. transition so that you're you're in the crab position and then you're able to bring one foot under and Go yeah on. so then it's the under switch because the foot goes under so it's a very structured system where you'll have the locomotions and transitions from one loc locomotive position to the other and then you have flows which are like choreographies linking those transitions and forms together and what is good about it is that it's a good entry way into getting a perception of your body because you have a lot more efference when you put your hands on the ground so you have more contact with the ground you feel your weight you also train your shoulders in compression which is lacking to most people's uh, um, movement compendium in their daily lives in our society and there's other benefits that feldenkrais practitioners know from like from the ontogenetic uh, ontogenesis from the movement development of infants that maybe people then either lack or didn't go through or need to revisit. So lots of benefits there, but it's still kind of a rigid system. 
But as I said before, when patients come and they need a certain security, that's when people start training uh, movement is also helpful because that's what they've been conditioned all their life. All our education is very strict, put you in a box. Um, so this is a better box. It's still a box, but it's a good box. And it's a box you can go through you know, and open up a portal. When I see some of the videos of you doing animal flow, I mean, I can see that, yes, there's these, these basic movements, but it also just looks like once you know how to change orientation in those ways, once you know how to support the weight through the shoulder joints and you know how to interact with your environment as if you were a four-legged creature, I mean, of course we are, we still have four limbs, but we, we generally have our arms up here and we manipulate a little here and there. It, it would seem to me that at the same time, it, it opens up all kinds of improvisational possibilities that you wouldn't otherwise have. Yeah, so that is an input that I got from fighting monkey practice, again, through Linda a lot, um, by doing more dance improv style work. And of course, when I learn something good, I can't keep it like separated. So my animal flow classes, they're not limited to um, the basic animal flow patterns. Um, and also from what I learned from Felgenkrais, I have used stuff from Felgenkrais ATMs in my uh, animal flow classes too, to just have people discover mechanical, possi biomechanical possibilities and for them to adjust the positioning of their feet in relation to the way that their leg bends or not, or the length of their shin bones. Okay, so it's something that I can't tell people where to put their hands and feet exactly. Somebody who doesn't have good shoulder rotation, I can't tell them, turn your fingers all the way back in the cramp. Or I also, I caution people to do not just jam into this form that I'm showing because of aforementioned things that I learned. So I have them explore these uh, situations that I put them in on the ground and I have them explore for quality. And then I will also use games. Mm -hmm. That's not something that like the other animal flow practitioner, teachers, practitioners, they definitely also use games. But then again, the focus that I brought from fighting monkey practice is, well, what am I doing with the games? It's not just having fun. It's introducing the complexity and the variability, but I also use a lot of other stuff in those classes. It's not limited to, do, to just being on the ground. That's also something that, um, because we're comparing fighting monkey and film cries a lot, it's like one thing you'll hear, hear a lot in fighting monkey practice classes, workshops is, well, you can do all you want on the ground, but you have to get to two feet. Mm -hmm. So whatever you try to learn on the ground, you need to do it on two feet right. because that's the way you live. Right. And it depends very much on your practitioner, I guess, on your teacher, right. um, but we always finish in standing. So our in basic... the animal flow class? No, no, in ATMs. Right, right, in ATM class. So yeah, so of course, not... in animal flow. How would people leave the dojo where it is? Like it's like <laughs> now crawl out and do the street. No, of yeah, course. Why not, right? Two feet. It's like, <laughs> yeah, we do a lot of uh, stuff on two feet too in the classes. Well, you know, a lot of people don't realize that there is a whole, you know, catalog. Well, I don't know how many exactly were created by Feldenkrais, but he taught many lessons in standing. And there are lessons where you're standing on one leg. And part of what you mentioned before is that there have been many generations of Feldenkrais teachers uh, since Moshe left the planet in 84. And um, when you understand some of the basic lessons, the pelvic clock or spine like a chain, some of these sort of classic situations that he created, um, at a certain point you realize that the variations could go on. He taught once, um, I think it's called the Peter Brooks, uh, there's, there was a, a company of, of a physical theater company where everyone was like super accomplished mover. And so he was invited to teach them and he just 
knew what they could do. So the very first ATM he taught, uh, as I've heard the story, was to begin by being in a handstand with your feet against the wall. And then, you know, the kinds of things he did next are things that we've, we've often done in ATM classes, take the pelvis one way and the head the other. But with this particular group, there was no reason that they had to start lying on the back. And um, certainly there really is no end to the positions that you could explore in this way. Um, or you could use weights, you could, you know, use the environment in these different ways. Um, as you pointed out before, that potential is there. Yeah, I think that the audience that seeks you out shapes how you work. So unfortunately, or maybe not unfortunately, but people who end up in third price ATMs are often people with pain, I think, and who have not found answers anywhere else or want to try this. Somebody recommended it because it just did miraculous, spectacular things for them. And yeah, so they, it's interesting because you say, yeah, when he worked with the dance company with very healthy and accomplished movers, he did something totally different because it's a method. So fighting monkey practice is not necessarily a method. It's a way to see things too. And there is a big difference because um, you won't have a fighting monkey practice form in any way that is like an ATM where you're led step by step. So this step by step is a big difference too. And I think maybe that is a strong limitation on the format, but then also of course the audience shapes it. So for me, now that I have taught, uh, now I'm doing it online, we're going to start back in the park, but I've taught through a martial arts school. The audience that I had, you would think it's martial artists, but like 50% of the people I brought and um, many people who come, they, and I'm not say martial artists, but the people who come over from martial arts, so of course I address them differently. I'm like, imagine the carryover or the interconnection that this has to your other movement practice. And, um, because I want to, I'm speaking to them and that is their background that influences how I will speak, what images I will use, what uh, parables or what, um, yeah, the examples that I will bring. And of course, then if you have people who come in pain and can feel their spine, putting it on the back is a good method, but, is there an audience for other playful, uh, more playful or more complex Feldenkrais ATMs? Well, only advanced ATM um, people who have done ATMs for years, right? I mean, I've encountered that situation many times where somebody new will come and who is doing this the first time and afterwards they'll be like, um, it was great for me. I felt this and that, but what the other guys are talking about, I don't know like where they took it from. It's like, that's all in there. Right. So it's very hard to have this fine tuning reach a certain level. Well, it strikes me as you say that, that every movement tradition also has its own vocabulary and its own kind of culture to it. And, um, you know, I think what's exciting about what you're doing is in some ways you're trying to break some of those barriers down for people and you're bringing in, you know, something from over here because it's going to help us do what we're doing right now. And maybe, you know, whenever you mix and match, you have to have a certain clarity about where you're going. Or otherwise, it just becomes random, perhaps. But um, yeah, I, I, I think that I wonder sometimes when, when people come um, and, and they have that experience, if they really had to feel that kind of disconnected from the practice just because it was their first time, or if there would be another way to lead people in, um, you know, and, and everyone's an individual. So, so part of this is just the art of communication. But um, you, you wrote something, um, it, you sent me before we spoke about shying away from purity. 
in hmm. practice. Yeah. Because it just it, like the clarity of applying it across. No, there is not every time that I try to bring something into a different setting, there's clarity to what I'm doing. And sometimes I just try it. And through trying, I recognize something good out of it. Sometimes it's something bad. So that people who will tell you there's this good thing, you always stick to that. So that would be purity. That was a purity I was referring to, but obviously it's also about the way that I teach. I'm not like an accomplished master and um, I don't think you should look for accomplished masters in a way, but for people who are still in the process of in many old traditions, code this knowledge of nobody ever being accomplished unless there is like a spiritual level where they this is something ten, um, attainable in the spiritual setting where they, you can be enlightened but in my world nobody is enlightened mm -hmm. and so if i don't accept that everybody can be enlightened and somebody acts like he's enlightened i will be very very skeptical yeah but yeah that's the purity i was talking about well, there's you, no purity i mean i do i make mistakes right uh a lot and uh, there is stuff that i can't do and then i won't uh, claim that i can and those are like important parts one of the people that i have encountered and i haven't mentioned yet because i haven't like also dropped it to you is uh ryan hearse from gmb gold medal oh body fitness uh, originally gmb uh, gold medal body is now gmb fitness very humble guy who I, has instilled a lot of that into me a few years ago and i've used some of their programs and also because the locomotions tie in with animal flow they so these people know each other they have a good relationship but yes so this admitting to limitations and not trying to stylize yourself as being some sort of attainable or not attainable uh, idol. Well, I, I was looking over at this other thing that you said that I wrote down, which was exploring things that feel weird and frustrating will yield interesting results. So that's not, not to be avoided, apparently, for you. Yeah, I mean, Fight the monkey practice if you've been to a workshop and you've done coordination stuff like the tribal dance so this thing where you move across a room and they have a pattern that they show of like a sequence of movements and you have you have to copy it everybody's doing it and you move across the room that is like the some of the worst confusion i have felt it also has taught me a lot trying to so in this situation being there and st sticking to the process of analyzing what is happening, trying to understand it, trying to replicate it, and then realizing that this very compressed situation is not unlike the other stuff that I've done in like the other movement practice that I've done. It's just that it stretches out over much longer time. Usually you go to a class, they show something new, you try to do it, they tell you it's not good, change it that way, change it this way. So here, nobody's telling you how to change it. And the people who are trying to tell you how to change it, they, they are trying to help you, maybe, maybe, not all teachers. And, but in the end, you have to find it out for yourself. So you have, you have these epiphanies in any form of movement practice, where you'll go like, now I got that movement. And there's something that the the way to get there and the, to learn the motivation to get through the unease of not getting it, it because it's the only way to get to the point where you get it so there is something that this situation in those workshops has taught me and that's what i want to express with that because with anything that you haven't done before it's going to feel like you can't do it if if or by coincidence there is something that ties back to your past that you just simply you can you, you get it it ties into something that you knew and then you simply replicate it but most of the things that you 
new things that you encounter, you will be bad at. So if you only stick to the things that you encounter and that you feel you're good at, that is A, either illusion or B, like very, very rare coincidences. And if you stick to those, you're not getting anywhere interesting. So when you try something new and it feels weird and you feel like you're not getting anywhere, keep at it. It, it Don't sounds like your Shiva, but keep at it. Right, yeah, I mean, because, because the alternative is just, this is too weird, this is strange. And so you stop. Um, this is my limit. If right, you and the learning your stops. Limits, you just define your limit. Right, it, it, it's, it's like we don't think of it when we think about movement practice necessarily. We think about the mechanics of the body or skill or strength or flexibility, but it's like the psychology of problem solving is also embedded inside of it. Um, just thinking of that, and, and I know it's getting pretty late for you, so we might wrap up soon, but um, this might be, well, <laughs> I was about to say come full circle. I've tried that with you more than once, and I don't think we're going to wrap it all up into a tight bow. There's, I feel like there's many more things we could say, but people can certainly relate um, to this one. We've, we've been in these lockdowns for last year. And so I'm curious, um, I'm sure there's many stories you have, but even just in a more general way, how has your movement practice, you know, been helpful or maybe, maybe, maybe not? I don't know, but what's been the relationship between your experience of just dealing with the changed environment over the last year um, and the unexpected things that have come up because of the pandemic, um, is there a way that what you're doing in the park, what you're doing with the nine speed tool, your animal flow or your work with people, has that, has that been a resource for you just as an individual dealing with the situation over the last year? Well, yes, uh, it keeps me very healthy as it has kept me before. So for me, it's like for my own movement practice, it has impacted me not that it hasn't it has not impacted me that much because before i was practicing outdoors i've been practicing outdoors for years in any weather you adapt to the weather okay there's some weather that's so shitty that you don't really can do much outside but basically i've been practicing the way i've been pr practicing this last lockdown year for years and other people have been stuck in like in their homes because suddenly it, their feet got like swept out beneath them because they like i used to go to the gym three times a week gym is closed what do i do now where do i start what can i do so i was independent of gyms i do like my tools okay so um tools are very helpful and I have had some people, I started some people on these, uh, which was not easy. Last summer, we were allowed to teach outdoors, so I could teach some outdoors. It's ridiculous that we are not allowed to teach outdoors for this long time. We're supposedly starting this week again. Um, so no scientific grounding for that. But um, the point is, Okay, it hasn't paired me. I can't. I couldn't go climb. I felt that now that I can go climb again, my hands have deconditioned to the touch of the artificial holds in bouldering halls. And but in general, what miss what was missing the most was the contact with other people, interaction with other people that I did create in some limited fashion. But it's been harder because you have to make it so more you have to find dates in very busy schedules to make it work you're still dependent then on the weather uh, but and you you lack the group experience and that's the most important thing like for me a big part of my movement uh, practice is teaching people in groups I have been teaching for Zoom, of course, also, and um, it's very different because then you don't see your students that well and all that. 
Um, so it, it doesn't really qualify that much, I think. And, but something that I also try to like, all the patients that have come with lack of movement because they couldn't go swim. That's like the, the worst thing. People who needed to swim to feel good, to not have back pain and couldn't go swim now for a year, they're fucked. So the biggest takeaway for me uh, is, well, what I've been doing is really good. And I try to give more people access to it. Um, finding ways to practice independently of institutions and rules that can be imposed on you. Okay, so you always have yourself. There's tools accessible um, or not, which you can use, but you ha you're stuck with yourself. Whatever uh, the world around you is uh, going to change, you need an individual practice in any form. It's, I mean, also that's also a very same thing for somebody who is playing a team sports. Somebody who plays team sports and never practices for himself is lacking, is missing out and lacking an important part of getting or staying healthier in his movement. So there's a malleability to the practice that's not dependent on the environment or external conditions or other people, but there's a way, obviously it changes the shape or the appearance or the the particulars of the practice but there's a way that the practice can continue no matter what yes the practice can yes you need to have a practice you need to understand how your practice can continue no matter what what because it can like any anything could okay but it's, there's like a hard thing to say but people could swim in their heads okay and that's what the Felton Christ practitioner would say and was but the problem then is and this exposes a lot of the problem of the mental component people need to need feedback people will go into a gym to lift weights they need the feedback that's why they want to feel wasted afterwards people who swim they want to feel like this they want to have this state of suspension in the water then they don't they, they, yeah that's why people do certain things and you need to always analyze what you take from it if you don't analyze what you take from what you're doing the gratification what it stems from of course then you're very vulnerable to that being uh, taken away from you because you can if you don't understand that you can you can adapt you can replace i like that that's great and I sense we could we could riff on it a little more, but I feel like uh, you might want to practice sleeping before long. What time is it past midnight eating, now? Eating is very important. Eating is very important. Oh, eating as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, Toby, before we go, if people want to connect with you online, how can they do that? The most active I am on a regular basis is Instagram. So Toby Portella, just written together. And I will think you'll put it in uh, the cap yep. and whatever, like, caption. Um, I'll send it to you also again. And um, because I think I look into that daily and Facebook, I don't really do that often. And then I have an email address. So if you're already that interested, you want to talk to me, use the email address too. And I have a website, but it's in German mostly. And there's nothing English on there. So it's in German. I think that's uh, you can Google Canada. Translator, DeepL, whatever. Um, yes. Well, we'll include that too. There, there may well be some German speakers who see this. You never know. Um, yeah, you know, I also speak French and Portuguese. So uh, because I'm half Brazilian and raised bilingually. Um, so you can access me on all different uh, languages. Uh, some Spanish, Italian. I would like to, but I have to spend more time with it. It's another whole practice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know. Any any last thoughts just on things we covered that you wanted to get in that you wanted to say to viewers who are, you know, thinking about their own movement practice and how to move forward today? Well, it's hard to say. We didn't, I didn't show too much with this and we didn't talk too much about the nine speed tool. But as it's laying here, it's catching my eye. It's a good way to say, 
anything that you find as a gateway that sparks interest, it's not bad. Like even if it's some sort of fitness toy, and this is not a fitness toy, by the way, but it's like, so anything that sparks your interest and gets you moving is a good thing. It might not like be there forever. You may change your attention, but um, that is what is like this um, playfulness and uh, curiosity that you have about playing with things. There's something that you can, that I would like people to use more. That's what got me into fighting monkey practice. It has been a world beyond that, but um, I still like to try out new stuff. And I think there's something that many people can relate to because we like to use our hands. We like to get our hands on things and um, get playing, yeah. Excellent. Find new toys. Yeah, and if, if anyone is uh, curious to get better sense of the nine speed tool, you should just go to Toby's Instagram and you'll see many different videos where he's manipulating it in many different ways and uh, really moving, moving really beautiful. I love, love to watch those videos. There's I'd love for you to try it. Yeah, no, I got to try it too. Maybe we'll talk about that uh, following up. That would be a lot of fun. I would love to yeah. do that. And, you know, maybe, maybe we'll have another conversation like this a little down the road. But um, again, thanks so much for joining me uh, this evening for you, my afternoon. And um, take care, man. So thanks for having me. Always a pleasure talking to you. It's been so long that we've done this the last time. And great to have the opportunity to do it again, take time to do it. Yeah, excellent. Maybe we'll make it more frequent in the future. Okay, man. Take care. Bye-bye. Well,